Ooh, well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, good evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here this evening or this morning, wherever you are on this planet. And uh, thank you for inviting me in your homes to play for you. I'll be playing a number of pieces from a number of scores I've written over the years. You know, most of these pieces have been written for at least five or ten, some for 75, 80 people. And it's an interesting problem then how to uh, present that in this day and age in a small room by myself. Oh, except for my wonderful family who are really good with cameras. Um, anyway, I'm borrowing some technology from the, the world of the DJ just to help bring some of the stuff to life and uh, be a little more fun for everybody. Right, well, let's keep going. On this next piece, I'd like to invite my collection of analog vintage synthesizers in on this one. We'll do a little bit of a remix here. Uh, this will be a piece from The Accountant. It was a wonderful film by Gavin O'Connor, starring Ben Affleck. Uh, let's dive in.
All right. Well, that was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's get back into the trumpet world here. Uh, I did a wonderful project starting about a year ago uh, with Chris Brancato, the great showrunner and writer, starring the magnificent Forrest Whitaker. And um, one of the challenges and um, really fun aspects of this was collaborating with Swizz Beats. He was writing all the contemporary songs, and I'm doing uh, the score. And you'll hear some of that uh, mixed into this uh, suite that we're going to do for you.
well, okay. We're going to change geographic locations here and move to Paris. I was uh, very, very fortunate to have a long working relationship with Bob Altman and Alan Rudolph and did quite a number of films together. I like to play a theme from the moderns, which is probably Alan's tour de force.
Okay, uh, I think now for something completely different. Um, my most recent film is, believe it or not, Bill and Ted. Bill and Ted face the music. And I can't really play you any of that score as it's unreleased. But what I can do is invite you into the process of some of the experimentation I did. Um, I went to the venerable Buchla 200E and uh, well, let's just see what happens with that setup Bill and Ted patch. <laughs> well, okay, that was, <laughs> that was a bit of fun. All right, well, for the last piece, uh, I wanted to do something uh, special. It's also something that I've never done before live. So, um, yeah, it's, it's from a very important film, a, very, a film that means a lot, especially in this, uh, in this time. So why don't you come with me?
Well, thank you very much for joining me this evening, and have a great festival. Welcome again. I'm John Burlingame from Variety. We've been listening to his film music and his jazz playing for more than 35 years. Oscar nominated for A River Rain, Golden Globe nominated for Nell, an Emmy winner for his television, a Grammy winner for his New Age music, composer of about 100 other film scores, including Eight Below, 42, A Dog's Journey, and the Best Picture Oscar winning Crash. Please welcome Mark Eichen. Mark, thank you for that fabulous power of music. Oh, you're very, very welcome. It was, it's fun to do, you know. I, <laughs> that's the big loss here, I think, in the last few months with this pandemic is the, the lack of live music. I think it's just uh, such a toll on everyone emotionally and uh, certainly the musicians themselves, but just on our culture in general everywhere, I think. But uh, so it's fun to come up with new solutions and new ways of, of putting some of that spirit of, of performance and interactivity uh, back into the world. Unlike, unlike most film composers who spend their lives writing music in their studios, you're no stranger to public performance. You, you've been doing it for ages. Um, is it still important to you to perform? I think there's no bigger rush, <laughs> if I use that word, no bigger high, no greater sense of fulfillment and, and just ability to communicate to people, to bring joy to people, to bring an emotional experience to people than there is in the live medium. Certainly as film composers, we're quite removed from our audience. I mean, the most we'll ever see is maybe to, you know, buy or spend our 10 bucks and buy a ticket and watch a reaction in, the, in an audience in a movie theater. So to actually be in front of, you know, 100,000 people and give them a real performance, that that's something that I will treasure for the, I've treasured my entire life and will continue to do so. It's, it's, there's nothing like it. Has your work as a performer helped in any way in collaborating with film and film producers? Well, I know that certainly in the writing process, there are times when I think of, if I'm sitting there and I think, you know, I'm sort of in the mindset of I'm being a composer, so I have to come up with something that's really, really good and, and, and I have to think about it and I have to, uh, all of a sudden I realize, well, what would happen if you just walked out onto a stage with your quartet and you were gonna, and you had decided you were just gonna play a, a, a piece that expressed you know, joy and uh, what would you do? You just have to do it. You would ha the people are waiting, they're sitting in their seats, they paid their money, you have, to, you have to play it now. And that experience and that ability to do that, having put myself in those positions in the past, makes me just say, all right, just do it. Just play that piece of music right now. And it's a, it's a nice little technique that I use to get over if, when I do get that sense of writer's block or just, well, I don't know what to do. I don't, I, and um, I just say, well, of course you know what to do. You just, you've improvised hundreds of thousands of hours of music, just do it again. <laughs> what led you into film composing in the first place? You know, I was not pursuing it. I, I never went to school for it. I never, I, I always admired those you know, the music in, in films. I remember, of course, John Williams and, and uh, uh, the father, uh, Jean-Michel Jarre's father, I forget his first name. Um, Maurice. Maurice, of course, Maurice, Maurice Jarre. Uh, we're one of the f first two that I remember, Henry Mancini seeing those, getting those names off the, uh, those names would stick with me. But it was never something that I um, aspired to. I wanted to play in, you know, have bands and play, tour and do that thing. However, I did write a piece of music that was semi-improvisational and uh, we were trying to get a record deal with it. It was for classical Chinese instruments and synthesizers. And we didn't get our record deal and it fell into our hands of a film director. And he said, you know, this is great film music and tracked me down and basically offered me an opportunity to score a picture, 
which I took. And four and a half months later, I <laughs> came out with actually having composed a score and, and I was hooked. You know, you had mm -hmm. the support of a studio, you had a budget to hire musicians. It, it was like, for me, this was like a, almost a dream come true. And uh, I've never stopped. What is it about film music that appeals to you? Is it something that perhaps is different from the jazz uh, world that you came from? I've always been, uh, even, even in the jazz music that I've done over the years, I've always had a programmatic side to me. I've always wanted each piece of music to sort of tell a story. I've been attracted to bands like Weather Report, for instance, who each piece is very pictorial. You know, it, 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 you get a sense of location and time and things happening in a particular way in their music. And that always appealed to me. So I think the opportunity to really learn and have to do that was something that was very attractive to me and still to this day. The other factor, of course, is that to do it effectively, to be able to turn on a dime emotionally, make the musical language do things that, that are very predictable in a language that's pretty unpredictable, pretty subjective language, um, takes learning more and more about that language of music, that beautiful, mystical, <laughs> language that we call music. And so every score I look at is an opportunity to learn more and to discover more things that can be done with that language. You've been doing this for a long time, and I wonder over that period of time uh, if the technology and the changes in technology have um, influenced or impacted how you did your job. Well, from a tech uh, how should I say, from a, from a pragmatic point of view, yes, obviously. Um, when I started off, um, you had to have certain, you had to have a thing, you know, with, with a moviola, with a film being drawn through it and a, and a, and a light that projected it. And uh, computers hadn't even come into the filmmaking business yet. Um, and now, of course, we're in a in a place where I could do the entire job on a laptop computer. Uh, so that side of it has, has changed tremendously. Um, in the, when we started, you know, when I started, you, you couldn't really make a demo of anything. If you wanted to make a demo, you would have to go into a 24 track recording studio and pay people to come in and overlay parts and say, well, this is going to sound like, or you'd have to be a really good pianist, which I'm not, <laughs> and sit down and play it. Um, so now, of course, with, you know, my, my 16 year old daughter can sit down with GarageBand and, and mock up something that would have taken tens of thousands of dollars <laughs> to do. <laughs> so that side of it has changed tremendously. And, but for the filmmaker, of course, it's great because they actually can see and hear their film with a very close approximation of their score long before you really spend any big money. Doesn't that add time and effort, though, to your part of the job? I mean, is it like doing a score twice when you have to mock it up on electronics or synthesizers before you go into the recording studio? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> it, it, definitely has, it definitely has its time component. component. I think that's one of the skills that a modern composer has to have is to be very quick with that process and to be basically writing in the mode of demoing so that as you write it, it's being written on the instrument, the fake instrument that, that it's going to be on so that if you like it, if the hair on my arm stands up when I play it back to me and I say, that's a great piece, that's going to solve every problem this film has ever had, I'm going to play it for them then you're already halfway there with the, the demo product. You know. You've done an increasing amount of work uh, on the television side in recent years, including several seasons on the ABC series Once Upon a Time, and more recently the Hulu miniseries Little Fires Everywhere. Is writing for television different than writing for film? Um, Yes, it definitely is, Most, mostly because of the um, time structure of it. Um, 
Having said that, something like Little Fires Everywhere, where you have eight episodes, you have all eight episodes in front of you before you have to finalize anything, you can sort of approach that more in a cinematic way. In other words, something you write on episode seven can go back and influence episode one, and you can thread those ideas through all eight episodes, much like you do in a film. If I write something five weeks into the writing process in a film, I can then integrate that through the entire score if it's, the, if it's a worthy idea. If you're doing episodic 22 <laughs> episodes a season television, by the time you're writing episode seven, one, two, three, and four have already aired. So there's no going back. So the challenge there is to get your material really codified and really strong and, and agreed upon and knowing that it's really gonna work and it's gonna carry you through the whole a run of those 22 episodes. How has this last three months been for you? Are, are you in a down period now, or are you continuing to write and record? And for all I know, um, in fact, you just indicated, I think that you've been working on Bill and Ted. Yes, I was similar to Alexandra. I was very, very fortunate in that two films that I've been uh, assigned to and, and working on, both wrapped their uh, photography and principal editing before the pandemic. So uh, Bill and Ted did in fact get scored um, all remotely. I did the entire thing from this very room that you've seen me in, um, used a wonderful orchestra in Budapest um, and used some various soloists from other spots around the world. Um, and then assembled it all together with a mixed studio and about 20 miles from here, but we were hooked up um, to the internet and uh, it all came together, you know, quite, quite well. So personally, uh, I've, I've been working away. I, there will be a bit of a downtime, I think, coming up, uh, but I, I've been very, very fortunate in the sense that I've been able to keep working. One of the uh, fascinating parts of your, uh, the concert we've just heard and seen was your Bill and Ted experiments. Um, mm. And I'm sort of curious to know, is that kind of how you start when you get a job? Do you go to your, um, your instruments in the studio there and start sort of fooling around and playing and seeing what works? I do. I, I like, as I mentioned, I mean, I've, I look at every film as an opportunity to learn something more, to experiment with something more. Um, Bill and Ted, while it was not nearly as an experimental score as that was, there is this aspect of Bill and Ted, which is very high tech electronica. And I just wanted to dive into that world in a way that I personally had never done it before. And the bukla is a very complex instrument, one that one can devote a lifetime to, to really understand. And this was an opportunity for me, somewhat selfishly, but also I think productively, I think the score has borne the fruits of some of those experiments, uh, you know, just to learn a little bit more about what, what can be done and what, what, what a composer can create. You were speaking about remote recording a few minutes ago and, and the uh, whole idea of sort of creating the Bill and Ted's from various places around the world. Um, has that been complicated or difficult to uh, transition to? And do you think there'll be a lot more of that in the months to come? It wasn't that difficult. I mean, the technology is just improves every month that, that it's out there. I think we've all experienced the, the wonders of Zoom and Blue Jeans and some of these programs that we might not even known much about, and now they're part of our daily lives. Um, it's, it's not perfect, but it definitely improves every time I use it. We find better ways of using it. We get uh, better, better products every time. And um, I, I do think it will have a, a lasting change on our profession. I do think that people will find um, working in a home environment for certain parts of their job are, are just easier, more efficient, maybe even more cost effective. And uh, these, of course, are all issues that, that everyone is concerned with. Um, and so far, I mean, I just refuse to take a, um, 
a lack of quality. So whatever we've had to push through and whatever we've had to to use whatever means necessary to keep the quality high, we, we've done. And so far, it's, it's worked. What can we look forward to from you in the months to come? Uh, will you continue to work in TV and in film and perhaps also in live concerts? Is that what's ahead for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've, I've done a, a concert like this for ABC about three weeks ago, and that sort of really inspired me so that when I was offered this opportunity, I, I jumped at it because it's it's a way for me to to get that that brush back, you know, to just insist you've got to do this from the beginning to the end and you just stand up there and for people and and <laughs> and give a give a good show, you know. Uh, Bill and Ted is coming out. They they'll be one of the early first uh, movies in the theaters. I'm working on a a wonderful film right now. Um, it's the story of Fred Hampton, who was the chairman of the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party. And his story is very timely for our uh, times right now because it really gives the history of some of the just uh, despicable aspects of American culture that have allowed the, our current uh, situation to, to exist. So it's a very timely film, really beautifully made by young director Shaka King. So that'll be coming out as well. Um, yes, I, I hear that uh, Godfather of Harlem has been picked up. So we'll be looking forward to that because, and there you go again, there's another really relevant story again, sort of again, the history of black culture in America and uh, any more education, I think on any of this is, is just good for all concerned for all of us. Mm. Well, this is great. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today, Mark. It's a joy to hear your music and to speak with you. So many thanks for being with us today. It's my great pleasure, John. Always great to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much, all of you, for, for tuning in and watching our events today. Thank you.